why, in a fairly deterministic context, God didn't give him strength, God didn't give him more strength to resist temptation. The answer that Leibniz gives exploits his own determinism. To the question, why didn't God give you more strength, he replies, uh, I answer, if he had done that, you would not be, for he would have produced not you, but another creature. This response, however, does not work to vindicate God's justice toward the complainant, except on the assumption that the complainant has good reason to be glad that he exists rather than not. Otherwise, he could reasonably reply as follows. That's right. I wouldn't exist. For me, however, the existence I have is not preferable to non-existence. That's what I'm complaining about. <laughs> that complaint would not ask whether the complainant deserved to suffer, given that he already existed and had committed crimes. The question it would raise is whether uh, an intelligent being for whom it would be better never to have existed would have been created in the first place by a wisely charitable God. I venture to bring up here a further consideration that might press Leibniz to say no, such a creature wouldn't have been created by a wisely charitable God. Leibniz defines the world and the aggregate of, as the aggregate of contingent things. Given the low metaphysical status that Leibniz assigns to aggregates as such and to external intersubstantial relations of substances, the question arises, do holistic properties of the world aggregate and relations between monads have too little reality and therefore too little metaphysical perfection to sustain the appeals to harmony that Leibniz might offer to justify the claim that a charitable divine wisdom might see reason enough to create an intelligent being that would be utterly miserable. Mustn't the net internal value of each existing monad's existence make a positive contribution to the sum of value of the best possible world? Perhaps this line of thought never crossed Leibniz's mind. It never crossed my mind until I started working on this lecture a month or so, a month or two ago. But it should have. Now, when it crossed Leibniz's mind, he might have rejected it in, in horror. I don't know uh, what he would have thought about it. But I, I point out the problem, it's one of the several problems about his idea of the best possible world. This now, I've noticed only two passages in Leibniz's works in which there is clear, articulate, uh, clear, explicit articulation of the question whether anyone's existence will, on the whole, be worse than never existing. One is in notes for his own use that he wrote in 1705 on an English religious pamphlet discussing issues about the creation of persons destined to be damned the author, known to us only as J.C., poses the question I have in mind. This is quotation 18, uh, or part of question, uh, quotation 18. Were it not better, such persons had never been. J.C. answers, a being, even in a condemned sinner, is preferable to no being as far as his being is the work of his creator. For it is simply better to be something than nothing, but the dismal miseries and torments attending the sinner and annexed to his crime are no positive being but a privation of well-being, the sole effect and product of malice and sin. One might think Leibniz should have agreed with these views. He is committed to the thesis that everything in the created universe has perfection to the degree that it is positively real and that evil is rooted in privation. He also holds that every created substance perceives completely, albeit more or less confusedly, the best of all possible worlds. At the most fundamental level in the Leibnizian universe, there is nothing to be perceived but perfection in higher or lower degree. So if pleasure, 
if pleasure is perception of perfection, why shouldn't Leibniz hold that the existence of all substances capable of pleasure or displeasure is predominantly pleasant? Couldn't he thus have given an argument that all of us will, get, will at worst get to limbo? So far as I know, Leibniz never goes there, not explicitly anyway. And he could have more than one reason for that. Uh, he's got a big problem about how to fit pain and misery into his picture of the universe in any event, and uh, this isn't the only problem. Commenting on the passage I've quoted from J.C., Leibniz says, I would distinguish and say that for such a man himself, it would be better not to be, as Christ, too, says explicitly that for such a man, it would be better not to have been born. But it is better for the universe itself that the matter be as it is. Perhaps respect for texts of scripture cited in this passage kept Leibniz from affirming the thesis, otherwise so well suited to his optimistic philosophy, that even those, if any, who are eternally punished have an existence that is preferable to non-being. The other passage in which the question emerges explicitly is more public and seems intentionally indecisive. It is in the Theodicy at the end of the appendix on Archbishop King's essay on the origin of evil. Leibniz describes King as doubting whether it isn't better to be damned than to be nothing, since the damned may find in their misery the source of a perverse pleasure that they take in criticizing the ways of God. Think of Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, uh, Leibniz comments, these thoughts are not to be despised and I have sometimes had similar ones, but I am not inclined to pass final judgment on them. King's verdict on the thought that it, is, that it is better to be damned than to be nothing is in fact negative. He says, "'Tis better for the damned indeed not to be than to be, but only in the opinion of wise men to which the damned do not assent." When he wrote the confession of a philosopher almost 40 years earlier, Leibniz might have agreed precisely with King. In the Theodicy, he decline, declines, quite publicly, if somewhat vaguely, to pass a final verdict on the thought. This is by no means the only passage in which Leibniz expresses himself indecisively, tentatively, or with highly nuanced modalities of approval and disapproval regarding opinions about divine punishment. There are enough such passages in the Theodicy that it is not surprising to find Eberhard hypothesizing that in trying to commend his philosophy to all parties, Leibniz posited their doctrines as suppositions and assigned them a tolerable sense in accordance with which he reconciled them to his system without committing himself to them. Certainly, Leibniz not only tried to reconcile the doctrine of eternal punishment with his system, but also argued in section 211 of the Theodicy that an originist, a partisan of the doctrine of universal salvation, would be e even easier to satisfy on the point, as Eberhard points out. I believe that Leibniz did in fact commit himself to a doctrine of eternal punishment. But such a characterization is too simple to do justice to the complexities of Leibniz's attitudes. To understand them, we need to take into account the placement of theology in Leibniz's epistemology. So section five, theology as jurisprudence for the city of God. An important discussion of the epistemology of theology is found in a letter that Leibniz wrote to the Scottish nobleman Thomas Burnett of Kemney in February 1697. It's already been on the table here today. Uh, and I quote from it, it's another longish quote, I think, long quote, yeah. Quote 19. There, Leibniz divides theological truths and inferences into two species, those that can be demonstrated absolutely with metaphysical necessity and in a way that is not contestable have metaphysical certainty. The others have at most moral certainty. For Leibniz, this is the chief partition in theology. Metaphysical certainty trumps all other epistemic modalities for Leibniz. In that way, faith must be in conformity with reason. 
Leibniz sees this distinction, I believe, as largely coinciding with the distinction between natural theology and revealed theology. 